यशपाल जी यू आर नॉट ऑडिबल आपकी आवाज नहीं आ रही ओके ओके गुड मॉर्निंग एवरी वन सो हि वी आर ऑन दिस फाइनल डे ऑफ द वेबिनार सीरीज एंड आर डिस्टिंग स्पीकर टूडे इज डॉक्टर सुरजीत साह फ्रॉम आई सर भोपाल सो बिफोर वी गो विद द टॉक आई रिक्वेस्ट माई फैकल्टी कोलीग डॉक्टर रजनीश कुमार वर्मा टू काइंडली इंट्रोड्यूस द स्पीकर फॉर्मली डॉक्टर रजनीश वर्मा प्लीज thank you yashpal ji and uh, i will tell you about uh, tell the participants about the speaker so the the title of the presentation is unraveling many body effects through raman scattering and the speaker is dr surajit saha department of physics iser bhopal surajit was awarded the phd degree in physics from isc bangalore where he worked on geometrically frustrated magnets through raman spectroscopy later he moved to national university of singapore for his postdoctoral research during this stint he worked on oxide electronics and 2d materials dr saha has been an assistant professor at iser bhopal since november 2015 and his present research interests involve complex oxides and layered 2d materials as close to 50 international research publications with a large fraction of these publications being in highly reputed international journals like nature materials like uh, journals sorry for the interruption nature materials uh, uh, advanced materials light science and applications nature communications scientific reports etc dr surajit we are privileged to have you here to speak on raman and ir spectroscopy kindly begin your talk i invite dr surajit thank you dr verma it was uh, uh, quite a mesmerizing introduction uh, thank you so much um, first of all uh, before i begin actually i must thank a uh, couple of friends uh, especially dr ajit patra and dr yashpal who kindly gave me this opportunity and uh, this is uh, first of its kind of an experience that i am going to have giving a presentation through online uh, which is a, a webinar series and uh, i really thank uh, all of you the organizers and uh, for this uh, opportunity and i hope today i'll be able to uh, convey some of uh, the interesting aspects that we have been doing but nonetheless uh, the first so i'll basically uh, try to divide this uh, whole presentation or talk into two uh, let's say two parts the first part will basically be uh, giving introduction uh, about raman spectroscopy and ir spectroscopy then uh, when i start talking about the applications i'll move on to the Uh, kind of uh, experiments that we do and what kind of results we get and how we interpret so i hope that will be uh, uh, you know useful to the participants especially for the master students and the phd students and of course uh, the experts uh, will find it uh, uh, you know such slightly different <clears throat> so uh, uh, i mean as you see i um, i get the title of the talk uh, something uh, slightly different i basically wanted to indicate that a uh, major part of my talk will be focusing on raman scattering and uh, since uh, being a condensed matter physicist uh, so i deal with condensed matter systems where i often hit across uh, many body effects and uh, so we learn through raman scattering some of the aspects of many body effects that's why i uh, chose to give this title <clears throat> I, okay so now so uh, this is uh, uh, the basically the group of uh, um group that i have here and uh, honestly speaking without this group i am nowhere whatever i'm going to present today is basically the you know hard work by this uh, set of people and uh, special thanks to the various funding agencies uh, most importantly my institute and then scrb and dst for the generous funding because of which we exist <clears throat> now uh, let's um, 
start with uh, so okay so what uh, we are going to discuss today is uh, basically you can see a flow chart where i'll be uh, touching upon uh, what we have uh, studied in schools or you know even in college days about uh, molecular or lattice vibrations and then uh, why do we care about these vibrations so that's the question i'm going to ask and then how do we prove these vibrations because if we have an answer why we care then we can ask how do we prove and then how we go ahead and for that we'll require some knowledge about instrumentation and some uh, basic uh, theoretical ideas and once we uh, summarize all those then i think we'll be ready to go ahead with some of the applications that we had in mind so <clears throat> to begin with um, perhaps uh, from the school days and uh, in in also in college days we have come across that uh, molecules consist of atoms and uh, and when let's say a molecule is kept at a finite temperature when i say finite temperature that means it is above absolute zero temperature so due to thermal energy the atoms that consist the molecule starts vibrating and this is the vibration that i'm referring here as the molecular vibration the, they basically uh, wiggle or they basically move around with respect to their normal uh, rest uh, positions and here is an example of a water molecule as one can see so this is basically h2 the red sphere is the hydrogen and the blue sphere is the oxygen so this h2o molecule one can see that there are six different types of motions of these atoms that give rise to the normal uh, uh, modes of uh, a water molecule excuse me. excuse me sir yes uh, your uh, your presentation is still i think it is the first slide only it is not moving. uh oh okay what do you uh, what do we plan to discuss this is the slide which we are seeing do you see now huh? this is this is the that very slide the from the beginning what do we plan to discuss the the structure which you are discussing it is in the next slide i think how yes. do you see yes yes now it is okay. fine okay great great thank you so much thank you it's uh, otherwise difficult to get a feedback whether it's uh, being conveyed or not okay so now as you can see in this picture uh, we have water molecule and uh, water molecule as we know it consists of h2 Uh, o so where these red spheres are hydrogen atoms and a blue one is uh, the oxygen now you can see uh, not that uh, a molecule will have any random way of uh, having motions of the atoms but uh, there are very fixed and typical uh, motions of the atoms and that is what restricts to what we call the number of uh, uh, normal modes of vibrations of any given molecule so for example here for the water molecule there are six defined well defined uh, six normal modes of vibrations and to generalize this one can see that if we have n number of atoms in a molecule then uh, if the molecule is linear then there will be 3n minus 5 number of normal modes and if the molecule is a non linear one then it will have 3n minus 6 number of normal modes so this is uh, something about molecular vibrations now if we go to lattice vibrations which is the next slide and the lattice vibration when i say as compared to molecular vibration now there is uh, you know there are additional symmetry um, uh, aspects that get into first of all when i say lattice there is basically an arrangement of atom which has long range order and uh, these are in crystal uh structures where uh, the atoms have a uh, you know well defined set of array or arrangements and uh, and in those arrangements again you can see at finite temperatures these atoms would vibrate and these vibrations will give rise to normal modes uh for a crystal or for a lattice say for example if i have n number of atoms per unit cell 
right? So there are three n number of uh, degrees of freedom, which is basically uh, the different types of motions of the atoms can have within the in itself. Out of which uh, three are the acoustic phonons. By the way, the phonons are nothing but the quantum of these lattice vibrations. So there are three of uh, out of three n, there are three uh, acoustic phonons, and the remaining three n minus three. Uh, um, phonons are optical phonons. Now uh, we, uh, I mean, most of the students would have by now studied in uh, solid state physics that, uh, for for example, if we consider a um, uh, you know diatomic uh, chain, and if we try to um, you know write down the equation of motion for the diatomic chain, we'll uh, get uh, uh, we'll you know get to see uh, what is called the phonon dispersion relation. So this is basically the momentum axis or the wave vector axis, and this is the energy axis for that particular vibration. And we get to see the two different branches. What is, uh, one is called the acoustic branch, which is what I'm referring here as the three uh, you know, vibrations as acoustic phonons for a three dimensional system. And what I'm plotting here is for a one dimensional system. So that's why we see only one branch. On the other hand, there will be another branch which is called optical branch, uh, which is uh, nothing but the optical phonons. And that uh, will give rise to three N minus three number uh, in terms of the total uh, uh, modes. <clears throat> now, interestingly, not all these optical phonons are uh, Raman active or IR active. So there are some selection rules. There are some certain criteria that these vibrations or the phonons have to satisfy before they become Raman active or IR active or maybe both. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll eventually uh, speak about all those and see uh, how many of them are, which ones and how uh, the phonons can become Raman and IR active. So I'm going to the next slide now. So before we move on, uh, let's ask this question. Uh, well, in the molecules, there are these vibrations, and in the crystals also, there are these vibrations. But why do we care about these vibrations? As I said, uh, that the moment there is uh, this molecule or the crystal is kept at a finite temperature, so these atoms vibrate, and that is what uh, give rise to this normal modes of vibrations. But why do we care? Now, there's a very important, very profound uh, you know, uh, uh, implication of these vibrations. If one sees these vibrations are very, very unique identity of this molecule. You know, any specific molecule will have a specific set of uh, vibrations and that is the unique identity of that molecule. It's something analogous to the fingerprint of a human being. So for example, my fingerprint is very unique to me and uh, this is my identity. Similar is the case for any uh, anyone in the audience. So, uh, so the vibrations are basically the fingerprints of the molecule. Now, this is not just a statement. It is very, very strong and a profound statement. Imagine if you have you know, a situation where you really need to figure out what molecules consist uh, your sample, right? And then you know, the moment uh, you take the spectrum and you really analyze, go through the different modes uh, of vibration that you see in the spectrum, you will be able to identify the molecules that uh, uh, that consist your uh, sample or the specimen, okay? And that makes this particular uh, vibrational techniques, whether IR or Raman scattering, um, both of them become very, very strong, uh, um, you know, widespread user. I mean, these techniques are very widely used in various uh, um, sectors. So this is one aspect that that is why we care. And then another thing is these vibrations, these uh, uh, atomic displacements are extremely sensitive to any internal or external perturbation or changes. So when I say changes or perturbation, what I refer to is, for example, if my sample or you know, the specimen undergoes a change in temperature, whether it, uh, it raises up the temperature or lowers down the temperature, these vibrations will be very sensitive to this change in temperature. Similarly, if this molecule or the crystal undergoes uh, a pressure change, then also the vibrations will be very sensitive to this. I mean, they're basically sort of sensors uh, which senses the temperature change, the pressure change, 
Not only that, think of uh, applying an electric field to your molecule or a magnetic field to the molecule. They are also very sensitive to these. And most importantly, the chemical environment of a molecule or an atom. So when you think of an unit cell, we already know the arrangement of the atoms. Now, if there is any change in the neighborhood of an atom, that means there is change in the chemical environment. And there is also a change in the atom-atom interactions. And these interactions will affect the vibrations of those atoms. And that can be very much probed through these spectroscopic techniques. That again brings out a, you know, a very important aspect, why we care. That means these vibrations are so important that they can become a sensor of various types of changes that these molecules can undergo or if they undergo. So that is why uh, we do care. And again, because of these two uh, uh, the points that I mentioned that the fingerprint and uh, you know, sensitive to perturbation, these techniques uh, can be used to have you know, very in-depth investigations in various sectors. Now let's look at um, how we probe these vibrations. So um, as the title of the topic says um, that we're talking about IR and Raman spectroscopy, it, these are not only these two techniques that one can use to probe the vibrations. There are several other techniques as well. But, but for, uh, any... yeah, Dr. Saab, please unmute yourself. Uh, I had some disturbance, so I have unmuted all the participants. Uh, am I audible now? Yeah, yeah, you are very much. Thank you. Now, uh, I'll uh, go to the part where I'm going to discuss how we can probe these vibrations, whether it's the molecular vibration or the lattice vibration. So there are several techniques which come under vibrational spectroscopy, but uh, keeping the constraint in mind about today's uh, topic. So I'll be just mentioning about IR and Raman spectroscopy. Now, uh, so I'll be uh, slowly going into um, uh, uh, steps where I'm trying to give a different, uh, the, the different pictures or the contrasts that these two different techniques uh, offer. So IR spectroscopy is basically a direct absorption of photon. Uh, I'll come into uh, detail what I mean by that. So IR spectroscopy, as I say, is basically a direct absorption of photon by the molecule or the crystal. On the other hand, Raman spectroscopy relies on the scattering technique where the photons are actually inelastically scattered by the molecule or the crystal. So let's go into IR spectroscopy. Uh, think of this as the molecule. So here is a, a water molecule, right? And imagine I'm uh, shining a white light. Okay, so this arrow basically indicates that I'm shining a white light. And this uh, structure, this shape basically says it's a band of, uh, of light. That means it's not a monochromatic light, but it's a white light. Okay, now typically in IR spectroscopy, uh, when I say white light, it doesn't mean that I have you know, an infinite number of uh, wavelengths uh, in the photon, but this is uh, typically in the IR range. Uh, so IR range, but again, it's a, a very wide band and I'm referring that wide band as the white light. So when I, uh, let's say we put uh, a wide IR band onto a molecule, let's say water, and we know this water molecule being at some finite temperature will have you know, six different uh, motions of atoms. Uh, now, what we'll see, so, so when I say this band, I know the intensity of uh, each and every wavelength or the photon, okay? So when it goes through the transmitted light, uh, what we'll see that some of the photons will have lesser intensity or no intensity. So here is what this dip uh, indicates. So this dip indicates that the intensity is negligibly small. And uh, as we move across, let's say this is, uh, you know, uh, the, the wavelength scale. So across the wavelength, the white band does not have the same intensity anymore, uh, the transmitted light, 
but the intensity ha it has a variation which looks like some dips. The dips indicate basically that those particular uh, frequencies or the wavelengths of light uh, have been absorbed by the molecules. So here it just to show that there are four different dips here and these dips are response of the molecule by absorption of the white band light that was illuminated on it. Now, <clears throat> how do we hide this uh, um, this control panel? Uh, uh, just hide go. Floating. Yeah, uh, you can go to more uh, the three uh, three dots at the bottom. Yeah, yeah, I think it has gone. Okay. Now, uh, let's say I uh, go. So these dips that we are referring here are basically the IR active normal modes of vibration of the corresponding molecule that we are shining the uh, white band light on to. Now, uh, in comparison, Raman spectroscopy is a technique where we don't use white light. What we use is a monochromatic light. So that is why you can see here the light, which is shown by uh, this arrow, is, um, is a monochromatic light. And it has a frequency, let's say, new naught. Okay, uh, this is uh, this is the distinction that we have in terms of the two techniques or the spectroscopic techniques. So yeah, this is something coming. Please move this uh, window away from the shared application. Yeah, uh, actually, this is some annotation. I uh, and it's not from my side. Okay, now it is going away. Yeah. But it's again coming back. It's basically coming and going. Yep. Is there a way to remove it from the screen? Just a moment. And uh, I can wait in the room. Yeah. Okay. Okay. I don't see anything. That I can do here. Okay, um, do something, or I can just uh, leave it. Yeah, yeah, please, please go ahead. Okay, I will keep trying. The thing is, I may not be able to see certain portion on the slide at times. Right, but I... that should be all right. Let's see. So now coming back. So here, let's say again, we have this molecule, and we're talking about Raman spectroscopy. So on the molecule, uh, now instead of uh, like in IR spectroscopy, uh, where we shine white light or a wide band of infrared uh, radiation. So here, rather, we uh, shine a monochromatic light, which is uh, you know, just a single wavelength light. Now, when this light um, interacts uh, with this molecule, so there is a scattering that happens. And that scattering leads to two different phenomena, one which we call uh, the elastic scattering and other where there is, uh, um, uh, uh, the other one is the inelastic scattering. So the elastic part, which consists of the same wavelength, the, the scattered light consists of the same wavelength as the incident uh, light, is the Rayleigh scattered light. On the other hand, uh, the ones which are different in wavelengths uh, from the incident light are the ones which are uh, Raman uh, scattered light. And as you can see in this, uh, you know, uh, just a demo uh, spectrum. So this first strong peak is basically the Rayleigh scattering peak and the rest other weak uh, peaks are the response of the Raman active vibrations of this molecule. So uh, the distinction between the two techniques is we use a white band in IR spectroscopy and we look at the absorbed uh, uh, light or intensity. On the other hand, in Raman scattering, it is basically a scattering process and we use a, um, a monochromatic light and this monochromatic light gets scattered by the molecule. And the major part of it is elastically scattered, which is called the Rayleigh scattering. And a very small fraction of it is inelastically scattered. And that is what is the Raman active uh, scattered light giving rise to or giving the idea of the normal modes which are Raman active. Now moving on to the next slide. So here uh, is what the process happens. Imagine that we have the vibrational states of the molecule or the crystal. So here I'm showing only the two states. The bottom one, uh, let me call this as the ground state. 
And the top one, let me call this as the excited state. Of course, a molecule may have multiple excited states, which are the response of the various normal modes of vibration of that molecule. So if, let's say, for example, if I really think of drawing the vibrational states for water molecule, I know there are six states. So I should be having six different excited states, right? And so is the case for the different molecules. So I'm just drawing only two states. One is the ground state, another is the excited state. Now, when I shine, let's say, white light onto the molecule, so this arrow is basically the white light, and whatever wavelength or the frequency of the light, which is exactly in match with the difference between the two states, the ground, the ground state and the excited state, that particular wavelength will be absorbed from this white light, and the emitted light, which is now white light minus the new n. The new n basically refers to the frequency, which is exactly equal to the difference between the excited state and the ground state. So that light will em emit, will be emitted from the molecule. And now by analyzing these two white lights, we can find out what is the wavelength that has been absorbed. And that is the frequency of the molecule. And that's how we detect in the higher spectroscopy. On the other hand, in and this is what uh, is the normal mode of frequency. And if uh, for a molecule, if there are more number of normal modes, so correspondingly, there are more number of states and there'll be more number of absorptions. And as a result, the emitted light will have white light minus new N, minus let's say new M, minus let's say new A, whatever. So corresponding uh, uh, the absorptions will be uh, removed from the white light. Now coming to the Raman scattering or the Raman spectroscopy, let's say similarly, I draw only two states. One is the ground state, another is the excited state. Now here the process is very different. It's not the absorption uh, phenomenon that happens in IR spectroscopy, but here it is a scattering process. So when I say scattering process, there are uh, you know processes uh, involved that happens here. So what happens, the electromagnetic radiation interacts with uh, the, the molecule and that eventually excites the electronic state of the molecule. So when I say this is a vibrational ground state and this is vibrational excited state, I'm referring to the ground state of the electronic state of the molecule in which this is the ground state of vibration and this is the excited state of the vibration but everything is the ground state of the electronic state of the molecule. Now, I'll have excited states of the electronic state of the mo molecule as well. So when I'm shining with high energy light, monochromatic light, let's say the new knot, what happens? The electronic state of the molecule gets excited. So this uh, green color, the dark green color arrow basically shows that the molecule is excited to a uh, higher electronic excited level. And then that basically is released, that energy is released. And in the process, which I did not draw a line here. So what happens? So enter energy, if it is released to the ground state, that will be the Rayleigh scattering. But let's say uh, there are processes where, you know, not the entire energy is released and the system comes back to the ground state, but let's say it comes back to the electronic ground state, but the higher state of the vibrational states. Then what happens? So the new knot energy that, or the frequency that we had given or the incident light had, will have a slightly difference uh, in the energy of the light that will come out of the molecule. And that will be new knot minus new N, which is nothing but the new N is nothing but the difference between the two uh, states, that means the excited state and the ground state of the molecule in terms of the vibrational states, right? So the scattered light will have, again, very much comparable to the incident light, but not exactly equal. It will be slightly uh, different. And that difference is nothing but the difference between the excited vibration state uh, and the uh, ground state of the vibration. This is, again, a response of the normal mode uh, new N. Similarly, if we have n number of excited states, so there will be n number of transitions that should be accommodated in this scattered light. Now let's see 
uh, some more uh, distinctive features of the two techniques. So uh, the very important one is the selection rule. When I say that um, a molecule has you know, vibrations, n number of vibrations, or let's say if uh, there are n number of atoms, so then n num uh, 3n uh, minus some vibrations will be uh, normal modes, out of which only some of them will be IR active and some of them will be Raman active. That means I'll get to see those particular modes in IR spectrum or Raman spectrum. Now, what besides a normal mode will be seen in IR spectroscopy or in Raman spectroscopy or both? So that is something that we're going to uh, uh, talk about now. Um, so very important selection rule is basically uh, think of the vibration when the atoms are vibrating. Now, due to the vibration of the atom, if there's a change in the dipole moment, just to remind the dipole moment is basically the product of charge and the distance between the two charges. So if there is a dipole moment change due to the vibration, the Q here is basically the normal mode coordinate. Now, when the normal mode coordinate is changing uh, due to the vibration, and if that corresponds to a change in the polarization or the dipole moment, then I'm putting this as not equal to zero, then that vibration will become IR active and will be seen in IR spectrum. And here are some examples. So this is for CO2 molecule, which is a linear molecule. And this is H2O molecule, which is a nonlinear one. So in CO2 molecule, you can see this is carbon and these two are the oxygen. And here, uh, think of the vibration where these two oxygens are symmetrically going away and coming back. So it's basically a symmetric stretching vibration. And this is IR inactive. Why? Because you imagine when these two oxygen atoms are going away or coming back, there is no effective change in the dipole moment, net dipole moment of the molecule due to this vibration. But on the other hand, if you think of this, uh, another, which is anti-symmetric stretching, where you see uh, this carbon is approaching, uh, sorry, uh, this oxygen is approaching the carbon. But on the other hand, at, this, at the same time, this oxygen is going away from the carbon. So it's basically an asymmetric stretching vibration. Now here, this will give rise to a change in dipole moment due to this vibration. And this change in dipole moment will make this vibration IR active and will be seen in IR spectrum. Similarly, for water molecule, this is a stretching vibration. This is an anti-symmetric vibration. Now, in both uh, symmetric and anti-symmetric vibration of water molecule, as you can see, so this is a symmetric vibration. So both the hydrogen atoms will be going away from the oxygen atom will be coming and also will be coming back to the oxygen atom simultaneously. And in both, in this case, you can see there will be a net change in the dipole moment, right? Because uh, oxygen and hydrogen will have a net dipole moment, oxygen and hydrogen, this other bond also will have a net dipole moment, and that this dipole moment will be directed along this direction. And that will always remain, even if this uh, hydrogen atoms symmetrically stretch. Similarly, on the other hand, if we look at the anti-symmetric stretching vibration, there also there will be a net change in the dipole moment. And hence, both these vibrations of water molecule will be seen in IR spectrum because they are IR active. And, that, and that, that's because they show a change in the dipole moment due to this vibration. But on the other hand, the selection rule for uh, Raman spectroscopy, that means a mode to be a Raman active. So here is what I'm plotting. So now you see this is capital P, unlike this is the small p, but small p is the dipole moment. And capital P is the polarization of, uh, of the molecule or the crystal. The polarization is basically multiplication of the polarizability alpha times um, with uh, the electric field E, right? Now, uh, as we know, uh, a molecule is, um, is uh, I mean, we have shown with uh, electromagnetic radiation and that electromagnetic radiation has electric field, which is this E here. Now, due to the electric field, if the molecule or let's say the crystal polarizes and shows, um, you know, some change in polarization, or rather if there's a change in polarizability of the molecule, 
then that particular vibration will become Raman active. So that is uh, the thumb rule for a mode to be Raman active. And now taking the example of a water molecule. So here is uh, again the symmetric stretching. Now this is, let's say, the state where uh, the atoms are at the uh, equilibrium positions. And this is one state where the, at the hydrogen atoms are far away. And this is another state where the hydrogen atoms are very close to the oxygen atom. Now, if we look at what happens to the polar risibility, and this ellipse, if you see, is basically the polar risibility ellipsoid, which is a representation of the ellipse uh, polar risibility tensor. Now, this ellipsoid will change at, as the hydrogen atoms, I mean, the, uh, the water molecule vibrates symmetrically. So here, you can see this has shrunk. And on the other hand, in this case, it has expanded. So that means the, uh, the polarizability ellipsoid is changing, even though it retains the shape, but the whole, uh, you know, I mean, the polarizability ellipsoid is basically shrinking or expanding. So this becomes Raman active vibration. Similarly, this is uh, asymmetric uh, stretching mode where this is the equilibrium uh, uh, state. And you can see here is uh, this particular hydrogen is far away and this particular hydrogen is close by. On the other hand, this is the other way around where this hydrogen atom is far away and this is close by. So in both this uh, extreme uh, states of this asymmetric stretching, you can see this uh, particular ellipsoid changes in uh, shape. So this again refers that this vibration will be Raman active. And similarly, this is the bending motion of a uh, water molecule, which is something like you know, scissoring. Uh, this bending uh, motion also gives rise to a change in the po uh, polarizability ellipsoid, and that again makes this vibration Raman active. So that means for water molecule, these two vibrations will be seen in higher uh, spectrum. On the other hand, these um, uh, water molecule, these three vibrations will be seen in uh, Raman spectrum. Now, moving on to the next slide. So now I'll talk about instrumentation. Uh, so I'll first refer uh, to the instrumentation for a Raman spectrometer, then I'll move on to that for IR spectrometer. Uh, even though this picture looks to be a bit clumsy, but uh, let me make it simple as much as possible. So here, uh, I mean, there are three different laser sources as one can see. And uh, as we know, lasers are, uh, I mean, here, the lasers are uh, monochromatic. So one can choose one laser. I mean, if let's say a spectrometer has only one laser, so one can have, I mean, here I'm just depicting that we have three different lasers. So I'm putting three different sources. Now, let's say I choose one of the laser light and then you know pass through uh, some optics. And then I basically direct the uh, light onto the sample through, again, some objective or you know, some optics. So this is my sample. Right. This uh, disc-like shape is basically my sample. And I have uh, uh, shown a green colored uh, monochromatic light onto the sample. Now what happens, the, the light will interact with this sample or the matter. And then upon interaction, there will be a scattered a set of scattered light. And those scattered light uh, can be collected by this, again, the collection optics and can be sent back to the spectrometer uh, with some set of um, optics. And then the main ingredients are basically this concave mirrors and the grating and the detector. So this grating will now see that it is no longer a monochromatic light, but it's a set of you know, multi-wavelength. Uh, because if you remember, uh, it is an inelastic scattered light that I'm now finally uh, putting onto the grating. And the inelastic scattered light will have various wavelengths. And this grating will now disperse those uh, various colored light onto the detector. And then the detector will be able to uh, differentiate the intensities of the different lights or the wavelengths and will give me a plot with the help of some software. So this is uh, typical about a spectrometer. The main ingredients of a Raman spectrometer are uh, Raman spectrometer are so the laser source, which is um, a monochromatic laser source. Then a sort of collection optics, and then we uh, a very vital uh, in uh, component is a grating, and then another vital component is the detector. 
Now moving on to the next uh, one, which is IR spectrometer. So in IR spectrometer, just to remind you once again that this source is not a monochromatic source, but uh, uh, it's a white light source. White light again, uh, it's a um, it's a wide band IR radiation source. And that source will be guided through some optics. So here are these uh, mirrors. And then uh, there can be some differences from one spectrometer to the other spectrometer. But the idea is, um, let's say we have one channel for the sample, which is what we want to measure, and one channel which is for a reference. Now, reference means the if the sample is just a bare sample, then we measure it with respect to let's say vacuum or air. And uh, then uh, the diff, then this light will be again set through you know, some optics and onto uh, a grating. Okay, and this grating will then disperse um, because, as I say, this is a white light, so this has multi wavelength, and this grating will disperse those white light, a multi wavelength light, onto the detector, and then the detector will detect the wave, uh, the intensity of the various uh, wavelengths. Now, you see, there are two things one has to measure in the IR spectrum. So one is without the sample, which is what is referred here, the reference signal, that basically gives an idea of the intensity of the IR source at each, uh, IR source at each and every wavelength. That means the photon that it uh, radiates, uh, each and every photon has a corresponding wavelength. And we need to figure out what is the intensity of that photon. And that's what is done through this reference channel. And then uh, we put in the sample uh, a channel a light. And then we uh, take uh, the measurement, where we'll see that the, samples, the sample would have absorbed uh, um, the intensity of certain photons. And those will be uh, appearing as dips. And then we basically take uh, the ratio of the two. That means uh, the intensity of the sample spectrum uh, to the intensity of the reference spectrum. And that is what is a measure of the transmittance of the sample. And that will give rise to a set of dips in uh, the spectrum. And these dips would correspond to different types of vibrations of the respective molecule. And those are uh, the ones, uh, the signatures of, those, uh, of that molecule. Now, what I showed in the previous one, and a previous one means the Raman spectrometer, and the IR spectrometer, you would have noticed that uh, I mentioned um, uh, a grating here, the importance of grating, which basically disperses the, uh, uh, the polychromatic, or I mean the white light. In case of Raman, it is the inelastic uh, scattered light. And in, in case of IR, it is uh, basically the source or you know, the sample absorbed light. And uh, now, I'll move on to a very uh, commonly seen um, technique, which is called the Fourier transform IR spectrometer. Um, uh, but as compared to FT-IR, FT-Raman is less common. I'll, uh, I'll, touch, I'll speak out why it is so. Now, uh, in both the cases, the FT, the Fourier transform, is the technique that is used. And what it means uh, uh, in that is basically, uh, uh, um, instead of um, instead of the grating, uh, what is used is a, a Michelson interferometer. Now that is the vital uh, ingredient or component of a spectrometer, whether it is the FT-IR or FT-Raman. Now in this case, you can see this is the source. So this is for uh, a schematic for IR spectrometer, uh, the FT-IR spectrometer. So this is the source. Now to remind you once again, uh, for IR spectroscopy, um, the source is a, a wide band. It's a, a wide IR source. Now that source has different wavelengths, and then those um, uh, photons are then uh, you know uh, let fall on a beam splitter, and this beam splitter basically divides the beam into two parts. One goes to a fixed mirror, and other goes to a moving mirror. Now this moving mirror uh, moves from one end to the other. And that gives rise to a path difference between the two lights when they meet uh, after they come back from the mirror. Okay, and that path difference between the two lights will give rise to uh, an interference. And that interference is what 
measured by the detector. So in case of uh, IR spectrometer, we put, let's say, a wide band source and that interfered light is then for, um, allowed to fall on the sample. And, and then the, the transmitted light through the sample is been detected by detect the detector. Now, again, one has to measure uh, this twice, one for the reference signal, that means without the sample. So you, one has to just measure this, uh, what do you call the intensity versus uh, uh, the energy of this uh, source light, light source. And then we put the sample in it and let the sample absorb the respective uh, 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 photons. And then whatever transmitted light comes out uh, will be detected and then analyze the two, basically take the ratio of the two and we get to see the spectrum, uh, the higher spectrum for that uh, particular molecule. On the other hand, <clears throat> this is the typical uh, layout for an uh, FT Raman setup. Now here is slight difference. If you notice, in case of IR spectrometer, uh, the, the light basically travels through the Michelson interferometer and then it falls onto the sample and then to the detector. On the other hand, <clears throat> um, in case of um, the Raman, FT Raman setup, now see the light, so here, um, here you can see it is an IR laser. So that, so this FT Raman technique is uh, mostly useful for uh, IR regime. So that is why uh, you can see it is an IR laser, the near infrared laser. So the laser source, the light source, the monochromatic source, um, with the help of some mirror, is uh, you know um, uh, mirror and uh, you know the optics is um, uh, is allowed to incident onto the sample, and then from the sample um, the light scattered light is collected. Now you see the scattered light will have, uh, 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 you know, no, is no longer a monochromatic light, but a, a, a set of uh, different colored light. And that light is then, uh, you know, directed through the optics and onto the interferometer. Now this interferometer, uh, with the help of the fixed mirror and uh, the, the moving mirror, uh, now, um, when it comes back, um, so this moving view, when it comes back, uh, they basically interfere, and this interfere, interfered, uh, interfered uh, signal is then detected by the detector. So this detector is basically, now you can see that uh, in, as compared to the IR spectrometer, the, after the interferometer, the light goes onto the sample, but here, the collected light is allowed to fall uh, onto the uh, interferometer. And then finally is detected. Now, uh, uh, I was saying that as compared to FTIR, uh, I mean the Fourier transform uh, IR uh, spectrometer, which is uh, very common in, you know, in, in chemistry and in any other, any other labs or so, or in general the technique, because the FTIR is, um, is very fast in terms of collection of the signal as compared to a dispersion grating based uh, IR spectrometer. But on the other hand, FT Raman is less common. Reason being, it restricts uh, to use restricts the use to only an IR region, and uh, that has a technical reasons for it because um, one has to remember the resolution of a spectrometer depends on the moving mirror, uh, the you know the distance that the moving mirror basically moves, and also depends on the precision of the moving mirror. And when we're talking about uh, you know wavelengths, for example, the green laser or blue laser uh, for Raman, uh, those are in nanometer region, the few hundred nanometer, where um, uh, the higher region that we're talking is in microns or even higher. So uh, the amount of, uh, you know, I mean, the techniques that we have available is not really appropriate for uh, using, uh, you know, FT Raman in uh, with, you know, uh, visible lasers or UV lasers. That is why it is less common to see. FT Raman is less common to see as compared to FTIR. Now moving on to the next slide. Uh, so uh, uh, this here I'm going to just uh, you know uh, speak out a couple more points. But basically, uh, as uh, I, I mean as it is said, that IR and Raman are complementary techniques. 
So that means um, uh, uh, for any complete study, if whatever information we get, uh, Raman can always complement and vice versa. And uh, it is basically the symmetry of the molecule or the crystal that decides what particular mode will be IR active or Raman active. And, uh, and in case, let's say the, the molecule or the crystal has a center of inversion symmetry, any particular mode, if it is IR active, it will not be Raman active. That, will, that means it will be Raman forbidden and vice versa. That means uh, if a mode is Raman active, it will not be IR active. So uh, in order to complement uh, uh, the study on any given molecule, when especially there are uh, you know, constraints with the symmetry of the molecule, uh, it is always that IR and Raman will complement each other. Now on, I'll basically focus more on uh, Raman spectroscopy. And uh, <clears throat> let's uh, see, uh, historically, as we know that uh, Raman spectroscopy or rather the Raman effect was basically uh, discovered by Sir C. V. Raman and Sir K. S. Krishnan uh, in, uh, in 1928. And in 1930, uh, C. V. Raman was uh, awarded the Nobel Prize. But around the same time, uh, in 1928, uh, two Russian scientists, Landsberg and Mandelson, had also discovered this phenomenon in crystal. <clears throat> now, when we say uh, uh, Raman spectroscopy, uh, we basically you know, uh, come to the point uh, where there is light matter interaction. So here is what uh, one can see, uh, the green colored arrow. So the thicker arrow is basically the incident light. Let me use the term that I'm using, let's say the green colored uh, light, monochromatic light, uh, which, is, uh, uh, which, is, uh, um, you know, which is shining the sample. There'll be a major portion of the green color light, which will be you know, uh, coming back or scattered from the sample, which is nothing but the Rayleigh scattered light. But there are you know, a very small fraction though, there's a very small fraction which will have different colors other than the green color, the same wavelength of the incident light. There will be uh, different colors, that's different wavelengths, which will uh, comprise basically a very, very small fraction, which is almost like one in a million of photon. And those scattered light are basically the Raman scattered light. And now uh, if we uh, talk about uh, you know, what happens in the process, so I, I drew a picture in the beginning to show uh, you know, the transition between the various uh, levels. So here I'm uh, drawing the different uh, uh, states, the electronic states. So the thicker lines here, you can see, uh, this is a thicker line, this is another thicker line, this is another very thick line. So these very thick lines correspond to the electronic states of the system, whether I'm talking about a molecule or I'm talking about a crystal. So this is the ground state. This is the excited state. This is another excited state. Now, on top of this um, uh, uh, very thick light, uh, line, you can see there are some you know, uh, uh, solid lines, uh, thinner solid lines. So for example, this is one, this is one, this is another. There are three solid lines. And these three solid, line, solid lines correspond to three different the vibrational states of the molecule or the crystal. Similarly, uh, one can draw the same vibrational states for uh, the excited state uh, one, excited state two. Okay, so they represent basically the same uh, vibrational states. It's not that this vibrational state is um, has a very higher energy uh, than this, and this vibrational state has a very higher energy. It's just that electronically they are at a uh, higher state. Okay. Now what happens in case of uh, uh, IR spectroscopy or IR um, absorption process? So um, a white light source, again, uh, mentioning specifically that the IR white light source basically is in the IR region. That means whatever light I'm shining basically encompasses in this region and has no photon with higher energy than uh, an than typically few thousands of wave number. So you can see this is energy in terms of wave number. And I'm also giving a corresponding idea of that light in terms of wavelength. So when I'm saying about 4,000 wave numbers, it typically means about two and a half micron wavelength. And when I'm saying about 25,000 wave number, 
that means it's about 4, uh, 400 nanometer light. So uh, in case of uh, IR absorption process, um, the white light source is basically IR uh, white light. That means it has various wavelengths, but in the IR region. And now corresponding to the available states, so this is this thick line is the ground state of electron, is also the ground state of the vibration. So um, the vibrational states will uh, undergo transitions the moment uh, they get to see the photon uh, of respective energy. For example, this difference energy, this difference energy, and this difference energy. When uh, the white light, the IR white light, has photon with this corresponding uh, energy difference uh, photon, this will be absorbed by the molecule and will correspondingly give IR absorption and hence dips in the uh, transmission uh, spectrum. On the other hand, the Raman uh, process is very different. Uh, just to remind you, uh, in, in, in the IR process, again, we're using, um, I mean, um, it's, uh, we use a monochromatic light so that monochromatic light is of very high energy, typically of the order of you know, few electron volt rather than a few uh, milli electron volts in case of IR. So, okay, just to uh, mention once again, so this white light source in case of IR is of the order of few milli electron volts to few hundred milli electron volts. Okay, and the absorption happens again in that region. But in case of um, Raman, the incident light, which is a monochromatic light, is of the order of few electron volts, maybe a, a two, three electron volts. Now, what happens, uh, the electronic state of that molecule or the crystal uh, will take um, this, uh, um, this light, the monochromatic light. So this is, let's say, the arrow basically shows the incident electromagnetic radiation of monochromatic uh, wavelength. And that is being um, uh, accepted by, and hence the electronic uh, state of the molecule is excited. Now you can see um, whatever the incident light has the energy that will be, um, you know, corresponding, um, and correspondingly, the electronic state will also be excited to that state. Now I'm referring uh, to that, uh, referring this uh, dashed lines as, you know, the excited state. Now you can see, uh, actually, there were no uh, electronic state available here, right? And these are called in a, um, a virtual states where actually there is no uh, real state available for the system. But since the photon is being uh, absorbed by this molecule to uh, and get and this molecule gets excited to a very high state, uh, so this is um, very momentarily, and then it releases that energy. And when it releases that energy, uh, the major part of the energy is released, and then maybe it comes back to you know one of the excited states of vibrational levels, and that gives rise to uh, what we call the Stokes Raman. But if you see, um, you know, if it happens that you know the ground state of the electronic level, but from let's say excited vibrational state onwards, if the system is being excited to a level uh, excited state. And then from there, after de-excitation, if the uh, level comes back to ground state, not only in, in terms of the electronic state, but also in terms of the vibrational state, then it gives, it gives higher energy um, uh, photon than the incident uh, photon. And that is referred as the anti-Stokes uh, Raman scattering. Just to um, differentiate once again, so in case of Stokes Raman scattering, the incident light uh, is higher energy than the scattered light. In case of anti-Stokes, the scattered light has higher energy uh, than the incident light. And the difference between the two uh, in case of Stokes process uh, is utilized in creating a phonon or exciting a vibration. And in case of anti-Stokes, it basically annihilates a phonon or kills a vibration. Now moving on to the, the next slide. So here um, again referring to the absorption process, where the white light, uh, you know, part of the white light will be absorbed in case of uh, IR absorption. But in case of uh, Raman, as you can see, uh, this goes to a uh, virtual state. Uh, so this is the laser light. 
So you can see this red, uh, let's say here, the red color shows the incident uh, light and it has been absorbed by this molecule. And then there is a you know, huge amount of photon, which is uh, of the same color. And that is basically the relay part, but there's a small fraction do not go by the, you know, the corresponding um, uh, 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 the color uh, wavelength. So blue is basically uh, here to show that it's a different color and the different color is uh, correspond to that, you know, uh, the inelastically scattered light, which gives rise to a creation of a vibration or phonon. And that is what is the Stokes process. Now, this is the conventional Raman process where a virtual state is, uh, is um, involved, but uh, but imagine a situation where, let's say, my laser energy is exactly same as uh, you know the uh, electronic uh, excited uh, level. I mean, the energy difference between the vibration between the ground state of the electronic level with the um, uh, excited state of the electronic level. Then what happens? It resonates, and that resonance gives rise to a strong Raman signal, and that is what is called the resonance Raman scattering. And in case of re resonance Raman scattering, it's basically the real states that are involved in the transition. On the other hand, the conventional Raman, which is a non-resonant process, and often we see the non-resonant Raman scattering processes. Here, um, there's a virtual state that is in place, uh, taking place. Now, uh, moving to the next slide. Uh, now. How do we, um, uh, uh, in a simple way, how do we understand the, the vibrations and how do we uh, take care of, or understand uh, the Raman spectrum um, that, uh, uh, that we basically can get to measure? So think of this is the molecule, which is vibrating. And uh, if we uh, just you know, take a simple picture, so in a simple harmonic oscillator model, so let's uh, assign uh, that this atom has mass m1 and this atom has mass m2. And these two atoms are bound to each other by a string of stiffness of string constant k, right? And let's also uh, consider the displacement of these atoms. Let's say the m1 by amount, let's say x1 and for m2 by amount x2. Now, if we write down the equation of motion for this, um, oscillation, then we have uh, something like this, where um, this is uh, the corresponding masses, and this is basically the, um, the uh, what do you call, it? <clears throat> uh, the double derivative of the displacements, and this corresponds to uh, the stiffness, and uh, this is the displacement. So this is the equation of motion one would uh, come up with. And here, this uh, particular uh, parameter is basically the reduced mass, and this is the net displacement of, uh, the, of, the, uh, of the assembly or the oscillator. Now uh, we can simplify this expression. So putting this as mu, which is the reduced mass and Q as the net displacement. So this is the simple uh, equation of the motion. And a solution for this is um, typically uh, like a sinusoidal wave, where you can see this has an amplitude, which is Q naught and has a frequency which is nu m, and this nu m is nothing but the uh, you know, frequency of oscillation of this um, uh, of this molecule. Now, this frequency of oscillation, as we know, uh, is basically um, dependent on the stiffness constant k and the uh, the reduced mass m. So it goes as square root of k by m, and this is a constant factor. Now. Here comes uh, the most important factor. That means the frequency of oscillation depends very much on the stiffness of, uh, of the spring and uh, the reduced mass, right? And now one can actually go and elaborate on this. So here, uh, what I'm trying to uh, bring out uh, this point that phonon is very, very sensitive to a change in spring constant. So any change in the spring constant will basically give rise to a change in the frequency, and that is what we can experimentally measure. And also, an, a change in the effective mass. Okay, one, one can ask, when will the effective mass change? Of course, when I'm changing you know, one of the atom, we'll get to see when such contexts come. 
Now the next point I'm trying to make is uh, basically an internal or external perturbation that again can affect the spin constant K and the effective mass M. And what are the internal or external perturbations that one can think of? For example, a change in the stoichiometry. So whatever composition I have in the sample, if there's a small change in the stoichiometry, will basically give rise to a change um, in effectively in the spin constant and also maybe in uh, the effective mass. Similarly, which can be uh, you know, achieved by some amount of doping in your molecule or system. Then for example, by applying strain in the molecule or applying pressure onto the system, or if there are additional charges or spins in the um, molecule or the orbitals. So basically one can imagine you know, more and more complex pictures where um, these perturbations, I mean, these will act as perturbations and those perturbations would actually effectively change the spin constant of the uh, molecule or maybe uh, the, the effective mass or maybe both. So eventually changing the normal mode frequency. Now, <clears throat> let's uh, try to understand uh, this model a little bit. So I'm going to discuss the classical approach. One can also have the quantum mechanical approach. Uh, Dr. Yashpal, um, has it been all right till now? Am I audible? Yeah, you are very much audible. Uh, it's just that the, this window, uh, which says, please move this window away, it up, yeah. it's on appearing. So how do I get rid of this? It is also actually um, bothering me a bit. Okay, yeah. Uh, so do you, have you moved the Zoom window to one side? Do you have any the, another window open right now on your PC? Uh, there is no window here. Uh -huh. Okay. So when I don't know how to get rid of it. Let me quickly check. Um, yeah. Seems okay now. Yeah, perfect. So I am the culprit. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much. It was yeah. bothering me a lot. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, now let's uh, look at the theory of uh, of Raman uh, scattering or Raman spectroscopy. How uh, we can, um, you know, in a very simple manner, we can understand the whole process. So again, let's uh, think of this molecule or let's say the diatomic uh, molecule where uh, let's say this molecule is oscillating at uh, you know, a certain frequency, which is uh, the new M. And uh, the, the oscillation can be um, you know, uh, written in terms of the displacement uh, coordinate or the displacement of the uh, atom, which is Q. And uh, Q naught is basically the amplitude. And let's say we shine an electromagnetic radiation. So in case of Raman, it's basically, let's say, you know, the monochromatic light. So that's why I'm referring here that uh, radiation as you know some amplitude, uh, the electric field amplitude E naught, and uh, with a frequency of light which is a new naught, and uh, so this is the monochromatic light. And when this monochromatic light is shown onto this diatomic molecule, there will be scattered light coming out of it. And let's say we are worried about now the E out, that means the electric field or essentially the intensity of the outcoming light. Now, there are certain other things that we have to keep in mind. So, uh, because if we remember that we said in the selection rule, it's, um, it's the polarizability that is important in case of Raman. So uh, now we can think of the polarizability um, uh, of the, the molecule. So if there is no vibration of this molecule, so we can have you know, the zero, um, uh, uh, what do you call the equilibrium value so when the molecule is at equilibrium, the rest uh, position, um, so it has, let's say, some polarizability, which is alpha naught. And now, um, if the molecule is vibrating and let's say Q is the displacement coordinate, so with respect to that, we can do a Taylor series expansion of uh, the polarizability. And then this is, let's say, the first term of it. And that implies that if the polarizability changes uh, with respect to the displacement or the vibration, so this term will contribute. Now, if this term is zero, then the Raman, uh, the mode or the vibration will not be Raman active at all. 
right? So this is again to remind that this has to be non-zero. Now, how do we estimate? So this is basically uh, the displacement uh, induced change in the polarizability, and that is added onto the uh, on the on the, uh, the rest value. And now, um, of course, one can go on and then you know, go on to the higher terms, but to deal with the normal uh, linear Raman, we'll have to stick to this first order. So now let's go to the uh, next step. So which is basically, we know now alpha, which is basically the zero, um, I mean, the, the rest value of polarizability and then the induced polarizability. And then uh, we also know the electric field. So the interaction between the electromagnetic radiation and the matter will give rise to a change in the dipole moment, and yet what we're doing is basically the dipole moment induced by the electric uh, electromagnetic radiation, or rather electric field. So uh, this is um, the uh, 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 the polarizability, uh, the polarization. So the polarization is alpha e. So now we can uh, put in the respective uh, you know equations of alpha and respective expressions of alpha and expression of electric field. So this is what we have, but alpha has to be now put in. And once we put in the expression for alpha, I did not go into the detail. This is a very simple mathematics one can do as a homework, uh, especially for the students I'm referring to. So one, we, uh, one can do is basically put this alpha not uh, plus this term and neglecting, let's say the higher order terms. This multiply with this expression of electric field and then eventually separate out the terms in terms of let's say the new naught, in terms of let's say uh, a new m, uh, and then eventually what we will see that this polarization has this term. So alpha naught, e naught, new naught, okay? This is one oscillatory term. And then there is another term, which is uh, basically the multiplication of the two cosine waves. One is uh, the cosine wave due to the oscillation of the molecule, and other is the Hello, Dr. Saha. I guess he has disconnected. Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you, thank you. Something happened in between. Okay. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> okay, now coming to this expression. So, where the First term is um, entirely uh, based on nu naught, which is the frequency of the incident light. And then the, uh, the second term, which is uh, derived from this, is basically you know, the difference between the incident light uh, frequency and the uh, atomic vibration. And um, the other one is, uh, the other one is um, the addition of the two. Now this gives, this is basically the Stokes Raman part, and this is basically the anti-Stokes Raman part. Now just to remind uh, the students once again, that the scattered light um, has a Rayleigh contribution as well as the Raman contributions. So the Rayleigh will have the major part of it, 
and the Raman part will have both strokes and anti-strokes. So the strokes refers to the difference, uh, basically the, um, uh, the difference between uh, the incident uh, energy and the phonon energy or the vibration energy. And uh, the anti-strokes refers to the addition of the two, which basically is a creation of a phonon uh, with, this, uh, uh, with this energy. Now, <clears throat> now coming to the next slide. So uh, now the conditions or the thumb rules that again decide uh, whether it will be Raman active or not. So again, look at the polarizability expansion uh, series. So the first term, if uh, to remind, is basically the first derivative of uh, the alpha, the polarizability with respect to the normal coordinate. And the second term is the second derivative of the same, that means the polarizability with respect to the, um, uh, the normal coordinate. Now the first term refers to the normal Raman active modes, that means the first order Raman active modes, where there is only one phonon that uh, takes part in the process. But the second term is something uh, many of, uh, you know, many times we come across, which is we call, you know, second order Raman mode and or maybe higher order Raman mode. So that basically means if this particular term is non-zero and is also uh, strong enough, then one can see the second order Raman processes. So this is what the, um, uh, the important condition, uh, condition. And the selection rule is, again, to see the first order uh, Raman mode, one has to have this uh, derivative to be not equal to zero. And similarly, the second derivative should also be not equal to zero in order to make them uh, appear in the Raman spectrum. And it is the crystal symmetry that uh, entirely decides these conditions. Now uh, let's uh, have a glimpse of the quantum mechanical approach for the same Raman scattering process. So just to remind once again that we have this uh, diatomic molecule, we have the incident laser and uh, we have the outgoing uh, light. Um, then uh, one can think of uh, in terms of the perturbation theory uh, as we study in quantum mechanics. So this basically is a third order perturbation process where the incident photon interacts with the matter. And uh, so this is basically the uh, photon uh, electron interaction. And then that interaction uh, excites the system uh, to, uh, a, a, to a, an excited state. And there this excited state basically either releases a photon or uh, an, I mean creates a photon or annihilates a photon and then eventually it loses uh, that energy by again uh, through um, what you call the electron photon interaction. And these uh, three different interaction vertices is uh, that makes it a third order perturbation process. And if one writes down um, the Hamiltonians and then eventually writes down the Raman scattering cross section, one will find this different um, uh, expressions here, this different. Um, uh, so this is basically I, which is the in, uh, initial state um, where the electromagnetic radiation uh, through these Hamiltonian takes uh, the system to uh, um, a state, which is the virtual state A, intermediate virtual state A. And then from the intermediate, intermediate virtual state uh, A to intermediate virtual state B, through uh, the lattice interaction, the, um, the, uh, the electron lattice interaction, where basically a phonon is created or annihilated. And then from that intermediate state B, it comes back to the final state by releasing a photon through this uh, um, Hamiltonian, which is the uh, electron uh, radiation um, Hamiltonian interaction. And in the denominator, what we have is the difference between uh, the laser energy and uh, the intermediate virtual state, as well as the scattered uh, energy, uh, photon energy with the intermediate virtual state. Now, when these, one of these or both become um, exactly equal to the real states, so that means when the real states are uh, in place in, uh, um, in lieu of the virtual states that we normally uh, talk about, then this uh, will uh, tend to zero and then whole scattering cross section, cross section will diverge. And that divergence is basically uh, I mean, a correspondence of the resonance, ra resonant Raman scattering process. And that gives rise to a, 
extremely high enhancement of the Raman signal. And that is what is called the resonant Raman scattering. Now, uh, so far, what we have is, uh, let's say the Raman spectrum. So on one hand, we have the stopes and other hand, we have the anti-stopes. Well, uh, often um, most of the experimentalists uh, deal with the Stokes part. That's because the Stokes part, um, uh, it's um, the phonons are created and uh, due to the Boltzmann uh, distribution, the anti-histokes uh, in part of the intensity will be uh, extremely weak and sometimes it is so weak that it cannot be seen. So uh, it's advisable and it, is make, it makes more sense to uh, you know, look at the Stokes part. Uh, so in the Stokes part, if we see, or even in the Stokes part, so basically, um, you know, a Raman uh, spectrum will have different peaks. So this is the Rayleigh part, and these are the Raman scattered uh, peaks, uh, or uh, which are corresponding to the vibrations of uh, the molecule or the crystal that um, in uh, uh, is in difference. So now this peak has a profile something like this, which is basically a Lorentzian. And if you see, this Lorentzian will have you know, very, three, uh, uh, very important three parameters to deal with. Uh, one is, let's say, the peak position. And that peak position uh, refers to the phonon frequency. That means the, the molecule that we're talking about or the two atoms that we had in the picture in the last slide. So there is a oscillation of the atom. And that oscillation uh, refers to uh, the phonon frequency by this peak position, the center of the peak position. Then the other important parameter is the line width, which is basically the FWHM of this peak. And that is related to the phonon lifetime uh, with this inverse relation. So once we know the lifetime, uh, I mean, basically the line width, we basically have an idea about the phonon lifetime. And then the other important um, uh, parameter is the uh, the uh, area under the curve, or basically the area of um, this uh, peak, which corresponds to the phonon population. So if in a, in a system, if there are more number of phonons, the corresponding intensity or the area will be much higher. And if the phonon population is low, then it will have much lower in intensity. Now let's move on to the next slide. Now, uh, we know those three parameters and uh, how we can analyze, but let's see more details in terms of uh, perturbations. So now let's say this is uh, the molecule or this is the diatomic system where we know that the frequency, uh, I have omitted the constant term, so do not worry about it. Uh, what I'm trying to mean basically is the frequency depends on the spring constant and the effective mass. Again, I have changed the notation, so uh, pardon me for that. Um, now, this particular frequency, as I said, depends on the uh, spring constant and effective mass. Now, any external or internal perturbation, which I'm denoting with different parameters, for example, P stands for pressure, uh, epsilon is a strain, T stands for temperature, E stands for an electric field, B stands for a magnetic field, or any other thing that you can imagine, for example, um, you know, doping your molecule or the, you know, crystal, um, with some, you know, something which uh, would change the whole scenario. Then uh, we'll come up with a new frequency for this oscillation, which is, let's say, uh, omega prime. And that depends on, uh, let's say, a change in the uh, spring constant, which is k prime, or may also depend on a change in the effective mass. Um, now, <clears throat> so let's say I'm talking about a change in the temperature. So if I change the temperature of the system, what happens? Let's say I'm increasing the temperature. So here I'm plotting the temperature scale. Let's say I'm plotting the, uh, I'm increasing the temperature of my uh, sample of the specimen. What happens if the specimen has you know, a positive thermal coefficient of expansion? That means with increasing temperature, the molecule or the crystal will expand. The unit cell will expand, right? Now, due to the expansion, what happens? Uh, the stiffness of this constant will become, uh, will lower, will go down. You know, as um, the, the temperature increases, the volume expansion happens, and the volume expansion uh, leads to a decrease in the spring constant, and that spring constant uh, uh, reduction will amount uh, to a reduction in the frequency. 
So that is why you can see I have plotted that the frequency is decreasing with increasing temperature, right? So with increasing temperature, it is expected that a phonon frequency would decrease. But I would like to also bring to your uh, attention that at very low temperature, when I refer to very low temperature, that typically means, um, uh, roughly speaking, uh, let's say below 10 or 5 Kelvin. So, um, uh, or maybe sometimes it can be slightly higher as well, but at what I mean is, you know, quite low temperature. So at very low temperature, the, the phonon frequency will show uh, not much of a response to the temperature change, and it will be almost like a constant. That basically imply that at very low temperature, the, um, the, the enharmonicity of uh, the crystal is completely gone. And uh, it is the enharmonicity, if you remember, uh, which leads to expansion of a crystal of any itself. So once the enharmonicity is entirely gone, so the frequency will uh, not show any response to uh, the temperature. So that is why I'm trying to show this as you know, a constant or uh, steep, uh, um, constant uh, line here. Uh, uh, Dr. Yashpal, um, I think I'm taking quite a long time. Uh, how much time do I have? It's almost like 12.30. Hello, Dr. Sa, you can you can speak for two or three minutes more. Okay, uh, then I'll have to summarize in it. Okay, so this is um, the this is basically the temperature response. Similarly, if uh, the if there's a change in the pressure, the frequency is expected to increase, and uh, and it's basically the response of uh, a volume. Now, I would like to draw your attention that any deviation from this trend is basically a surprise. And that's where the whole story uh, revolves around. And one. Uh, am I like audible? Us, I'm not sure. About it. Yeah, I am audible. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Yes, you are audible, Mr. Shall I go ahead? Sure, sure, sure. So um, it's basically the surprise that we often uh, look forward to. And here is um, uh, the typical behavior I showed. Now, um, if I change the temperature of a system, so this is uh, basically to note that how the frequency would change. So there is something, a response to due to the enharmonicity and that there may be you know, very uh, interesting effects that may uh, present, be present in a system. For example, the electron phonon interaction, spin phonon interaction, and those also would correspond to a change in the frequency uh, of the system. So here is what the typical expression for enharmonicity um, change. But um, the important uh, other aspects are, for example, if uh, the molecule has a spin, then the spins would have you know, uh, an exchange interaction. And that means I have you know, uh, you know, a slightly different an interaction between the two atoms apart from the usual spring constant. And that uh, would also amount to a change in the uh, frequency. And that can be uh, you know, proportional to uh, what you call the spin phonon coupling constant. And this is basically the interaction term. Now, in order to uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, speak about the applications. So as I said, the two important, uh, 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 you know, uh, the fingerprint is an important aspect and uh, the, um, uh, what do you call this, uh, the sensitivity uh, to any environment or any uh, you know, uh, perturbation. So because of that, uh, it has seen various uh, uh, you know, different sectors where Raman spectroscopy has been in application. Uh, name it like cosmetic energy or you know, food beverages or anything, even forensic science, pharmaceuticals. So there are biology, of course, chemistry. There are um, you know, all these sectors have seen uh, applications of Raman spectroscopy, but what we often deal with is materials and nanomaterials, and uh, here is where we are mostly uh, you know interested in. So we often we look at phonons, but apart from phonons, we also try to look at uh, magnons in the system or the specimen, crystal field transitions, and then orbital waves or electro um, electron phonon interactions, spin phonon interaction even phonon-phonon interactions. So that's where uh, I connect this as the many body effects. And now I'll uh, move on. I mean, I'll take uh, you know, a couple of examples. And um, Yashpanji or Varmaji, uh, please stop me if you think I'm actually crossing my time uh, beyond uh, which I should be. Of course, I, I'm already crossing the time. 
But maybe if you can allow me about five minutes, I can quickly go through what type of results one can yeah, expect. Yeah, sure, yeah. Yes, so Dr. this I'm, okay. Thank you so much. So this I'm referring to some examples that we deal with in the lab. So this is uh, about two-dimensional layered materials, like we know graphene and you know uh, similar uh, systems. So here is. Uh, for graphene, uh, one knows, uh, one would know uh, that this is the phonon dispersion relation. And in the phonon dispersion relation, there are six different uh, uh, you know, branches. So these are three acoustic branches and three optical branches. And um, uh, this comes because there are two atoms, carbon atoms per uh, primitive unit cell in graphene. And now these three optical modes are the one that we are worried about in Raman. So these uh, vibrations, uh, one is called uh, this uh, uh, in-plane vibration, which is basically, you can see these atoms move uh, you know, with respect to each other. And this another one, uh, which is also another in-plane vibration. So this is uh, the one. And then this is out of plane vibration of the carbon atoms. And uh, then similarly, these acoustic modes are also there, which we don't deal with. Uh, are also in-plane vibrations of the carbon atoms and out-of-plane vibrations. And these two out-of-plane vibrations are often in literature referred as the flexural phonons or flexural modes. And uh, so um, I think some of the audience, uh, if not everyone in the audience would know, graphene has you know, this very unique uh, band structure. And at uh, some of the specific points, which are called the K points, there is this, uh, uh, what do you call the Dirac cone. And that's where uh, you know, all this uh, novel phenomena happen. And this is very important in understanding the Raman processes of graphene. So typically, the graphene Raman spectrum has uh, three of these uh, peaks. One is called the D peak, which is basically a measure of the defect in graphene. And other is called the G peak, which is basically the in-plane vibration that I just uh, you know, um, uh, um, you know, pointed in a couple of slides back. And other is the 2D peak, uh, which is basically uh, is not a crystal vibration, but is associated with a crystal vibration through a certain phenomenon. I'll try to go uh, uh, as I, uh, I'll try to explain as I go ahead. So the G peak is basically, you can see this is uh, the cone and the G peak is basically a transition involved involving the real states and then you know, a creation of phonon. And that is why even uh, if graphene is single layer, one can imagine in single layer, uh, you know, um, the sample is giving me such a strong uh, Raman signal. So this is because this is a resonant process. You can see the two, um, um, uh, what you call the real states are involved and that is why this process is a resonant process. And that is why the G peak is so strong. Now, <clears throat> This is the defect peak. Defect peak is also uh, is strong. And here, there's a defect state which is involved in uh, giving this peak. So as and when, when graphene has a defect state, so this particular uh, mode will be excited. And again, because these real states are involved in this vibration, so we get to see this mode as a strong uh, peak. And uh, <clears throat> this is another mode. Uh, I'll not worry about it. So this is the 2D peak. This 2D peak refers to uh, you know, um, the two uh, in-plane transverse optical phonon being used in this whole transition process. So uh, the electron is excited to the excited state, and then it's moved on to the another uh, you know, K, K point, which is the K prime. And then it brings back to the previous K point, and then you know, brings back to the ground state. So since two TO phonons, the in-plane phonons, are involved in this. That is why it is called uh, the uh, two, um, uh, two D uh, process and uh, two phonon process. And it is because two D because if you look at the frequency of this phonon, it's exactly double of the frequency of the D P. So that is why it is called two D. But it has nothing to do with the defect in the vibration. Even if your graphene has no defect, the two D will be present. And that's because these two phonons are involved, and that's why it is. Uh, second order process, second order phonon. Now, as uh, one goes from a single layer to multi-layer or even very thick layer graphene, one will see that the 2D peak evolves uh, uh, in terms of the spectral shape. So it goes from one single um, you know, feature to uh, a four feature uh, spectral shape, and then six uh, spectral shape, and then it basically goes to another spectral shape, and then you know, very thick, the HOPG has only two peaks. 
so basically what i'm trying to say say that raman is a very sensitive tool um, and a very important tool and sensitive to the number of layers that your graphene sample has and it can very much tell very accurately uh, how many layers one has now we have used uh, graphene and also boron nitride to create some heterostructures and we have done some interesting experiments and these are my uh, uh, group of people who are involved in this and this is in collaboration with uh, anindas group at isc so here you can see the respective uh, samples so let me just quickly go through so here i have boron nitride uh, layer uh, on a silicon substrate graphene layer on silicon substrate here i have a bilayer that means graphene boron nitride on graphene on silicon uh, silicon substrate and here i have a sandwiched uh, boron nitride graphene boron nitride on silicon substrate so all these uh, have typical uh, raman signatures so this is boron nitride uh, raman signal this is graphene raman signal and this is uh, since it has both graphene boron nitride so i have both the, all the signals and this is uh, another one now doing uh, a very systematic and thorough raman experiment on this four samples what we could figure out is the thermal conductivity of all these samples so there is something uh, you know really outside the routine uh, application of uh, uh, raman one can actually also prove the thermal conductivity and also uh, interfacial uh, you know heat conduction of such structures so here is what we have uh, been able to uh, you know quantify so this is for the boron nitride this is um, the thermal conductivity and this is the interface thermal conduction that means the in plane heat conduction and out of plane heat conduction given with respective units and these are the numbers this is for the uh, you know graphene single layer graphene uh, so this is the typical uh, thermal conductivity when it is supported on uh, the silicon substrate and this is for you know two layer structure and this is for three layer structure and there are interesting uh, physics behind it why we see this trend and there is an important point that i would like to say that when graphene or boron nitride is put on uh, a silicon substrate a silicon oxide substrate we know that silicon substrate is optically very polished and very um, you know it's like a very smooth surface but if you look at in, in nanometer scales you know a few tens of nanometer scales there are rough terrains and that's where graphene gets uh, you know um, uh, uh, graphene becomes suspended and the contacts of graphene with the substrate uh, gets really hindered and that uh, these um, points Uh, play a very major role in you know uh, controlling the thermal conductivity and also the thermal uh, conduction uh, interface thermal conduction and uh, we figure out that you know this uh, uh, you know coupled structure basically boron nitride and graphene uh, layer structure will be a better choice for a better heat dissipation device in devices now there is another example of 2d material which is mot2 here um, it is well known that uh, it shows a center of inversion symmetry as we go from high temperature to low temperature and that can be very nicely picked up in the raman signature you can see rest of the phonons are as they are but only this particular vibration show a clear splitting of this mode and that's where all the play uh, begin and uh, this has a lot of implication with the topological aspects of this particular compound mot2 and that's where we also um, were interested in so here we can see that there is a hysteresis of this um, of this uh, compound uh, over temperature and the hysteresis is not is not only in transport but also in raman and here are the signatures of hysteresis of the phonons and more importantly we see that one particular phonon show a very different behavior if i try to remind the audience that frequency should decrease with increasing temperature that is what one should be expecting but on the other hand for this particular mode what we see the frequency increases with increasing temperature now with reductionist approach we have been able to figure out that it is because of an electron phonon coupling that exists in the system that is why we see this particular behavior now i'll go to a couple of examples of uh, complex oxides so here uh, complex oxide means where one can think of magnetism ferroelectricity and you know ferroelasticity and here is a typical um, you know uh, the triangle where one can think of coupling these different degrees of freedom or the, uh, the properties and uh, here is one example of barium manganite one specific uh, structure which is 15r and this uh, has this particular spin structure which is already known and this uh, compound shows a nil ordering below 230 kelvin and also ferroelectric uh, transition below 273 kelvin 
which is a um, little below room temperature. And in, in both these uh, transition, it is the manganese atom or ion which is involved. And that's why this is called a type two multiteroid. And here through Raman, we have been able to probe these phenomenon. And uh, here I would like to show that, uh, just to remind you that this uh, uh, you know, dark uh, maroon color is uh, the curve which is expected for a phonon uh, to behave with temperature. But any deviation, something like this, or exactly opposite, is something of interesting uh, to us. And that's what we see, that some of the phonons that actually appear below this uh, temperature. So this is, um, this is one nil temperature, which we have discovered. It was not reported in uh, uh, literature, which is at 330K. And uh, the other nil temperature, which is at 230 Kelvin, which is known in the literature, are because of the different uh, you know, spin orientations. And then there is intermediate uh, transition that is the ferroelectric transition. And we see that some new modes appear below these transition, whether it's the nil temperature or the ferroelectric uh, transition. And also at low temperature, there are some bifurcations of these modes that means some modes split. And not only that, these modes show, start to show deviation from the normal expected behavior. And here is another mode which goes exactly opposite to the trend expected. Uh, so these are the behaviors of the phonons and one can go into the detail uh, in analyzing this uh, uh, behavior and one can find a correlation with the magnetic, uh, magnetic uh, study, the magnetization of the system and the also heat capacity where we also probe that uh, you know these nil orderings happen at these respective temperatures. And based on that, we say that uh, this particular system uh, shows spin phonon interaction, spin phonon coupling, and also magnet restriction, uh, which could be proved uh, using uh, Raman spectroscopy. Now, this is a very standard example of barium tatnet. There also we could uh, figure out something very interesting where ferro electricity uh, could be, uh, you know, seen to have a very strong um, association with uh, phonon uh, and harmonicity. So, uh, just to remind the audience that the barium tatnet, as we lower the temperature, it undergoes various phase transitions. It, at very high temperature, it is in cubic phase, then it goes to tetragonal phase, then it goes to orthorhombic phase, then it goes to rhombohedral phase. And as we know, as the structure changes, though Raman will uh, Raman will show a corresponding response to these transitions, and that's what we see. So here are uh, corresponding responses in the Raman spectrum. One can go into the detail if necessary. And uh, just to uh, remind you that this is not just a pure barium tablet, we also have looked at europium dope barium tablet, where europium has been maintained at two plus state, um, uh, just as uh, the barium two plus state. And based on that, we find that um, the typical phonon behavior is not present in some of the phonons. And uh, based on that, we see uh, um, I mean, the phonons show a uh, you know, response to phase transitions. For example, uh, this is a phase transition. This is another phase transition. So here you can see a new phonon appearing and then phonon starts to show uh, you know, exactly opposite behavior. So th those are the new modes appear and then you know, the phonon um, start to show anomalous behavior. Uh, and that is basically because the oxygen vibrations that give rise to these um, phonons uh, have a larger displacement uh, which are in association with barium atoms. And we find that the enharmonicity drastically drops as the ferroelectric transition temperature also drops um, as uh, the europium is increased in the system. And this we have published in physical review materials. And based on that, I would like to summarize that the take home message that IR and Raman spectroscopy are complementary and very vital techniques. And these vibrations are fingerprints and sensitive to different perturbations. And we have just given a few of examples. And probing these phonons can shed light to various interactions in the system. And that can open up you know, new physics or you know, new phenomena. With that, I would like to thank all the audience, everyone, including Kishpal and Parmaji. Thank you so much. And I'm, I really apologize for the additional time that I have taken. Thank you, Dr. Saha. Now, there are a couple of questions which the audience have sh uh, shared with us. Uh, and I request you if you can answer them in brief, it will be better. Uh, there is a question from Kapil Yadav. Uh, he is saying that uh, can a molecule have zero vibrational energy or zero rotational energy? Well, the moment we say there is a vibrational energy, that means uh, it has some finite value. 
A zero means um, uh, I have um, brought down the sample or the molecule to zero, absolute zero temperature. So when the molecule or the sample is at absolute zero temperature, it has no vibration. So there we can say that uh, it has a zero energy. Okay. Uh, there is uh, another question from Nitika. She is asking why are spectra in UV, UV visible region different from infrared region? Why don't major constituents of air absorb infrared radiation? Okay, UV visible spectrum and IR spectrum um, originate from very different uh, processes or phenomena. So IR spectrum, as I was, uh, I mean, we briefly discussed, is basically uh, because of uh, absorption by the molecules, uh, which are the vibrating. But UV visible, when we say, it deals with electronic states and no longer with the vibrations. So electronic states, wherever there is an absorption in the electronic states, then only the UV visible spectrum will show a response, a dip or whatsoever. So that is why they are very different. The UV visible spectrum will not deal with the vibrations of the molecule. Okay, hope this is clear to her. Now there is a question from Monica Dubey. She is from Amity University. Why Raman scattering is weak? Ah, okay. Why Raman scattering is weak? It's uh, because if you see, um, See, when uh, electromagnetic radiation, or let's say the photon interacts with the molecule, okay, so there is uh, elastic process and there is also inelastic process. It is um, the systems of the nature that basically um, would like to have the elastic processes to be in favor. But of course, uh, that doesn't mean that inelastic processes will not be present. That is why the inelastic processes which give rise to Raman is uh, very low in number and hence the Raman signal is very weak. That means when the photons are you know, hitting on, let's say the sample, uh, the major number of photons will be elastically scattered, but only very small number of photon, very small fraction of photons will be inelastic, inelastically scattered. And that is what gives rise to Raman signal. And that is why the Raman signal is so weak. There is one from Dr. Thakur Prasad. Uh, what is difference between Raman spectroscopy and surface resonance Raman spectroscopy? Okay. So in case of uh, Raman spectroscopy, mm, um, we just put the sample under the microscope or whatsoever, and then record. Means uh, the photon interacts with the sample and then the scattered light is collected. Now, in case of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, we have to do something additional to it. We have to treat uh, the sample with certain uh, enhancer. So often people use nanoparticles, maybe gold nanoparticles, silver nanoparticle, which would give rise to uh, a local electric field on the sample when we uh, shine the electromagnetic radiation. What I mean, so in a normal Raman scattering, when we have the electric field with the radiation, so that is constrained to whatever intensity we can give. But the moment we put some, um, uh, let's say nanoparticles, um, the metallic nanoparticles, those metallic nanoparticles will enhance the local electric field by manifold. And due to that, the electric signal, uh, which is seen by the sample is manifold higher than the normal Raman scattering scenario. And that's when the surface enhanced uh, Raman scattering will be much higher. And that's the difference between a normal Raman scattering process and the surface uh, enhanced Raman scattering process. I think this is because of the localized surface plasma resonance effect. Exactly, exactly. Uh, Avinas is asking, uh, please explain about ATR technique and KBR technique in IR spectroscopy. Okay, so that is something which is not really in my territory, but maybe I'll try to briefly uh, explain. Um, so um, ATR and KBR, uh, um, no, maybe I'll skip this question because uh, it needs uh, some more thought in it. Yeah, uh, then, then I say I, will, I would like 
to ask Avinas to write something about this question to you, and then you can respond it later. I can uh, answer to possible. him specifically. Yeah, definitely. It is uh, possible. There is it just needs... from Raj. Yeah, sorry. sorry. Raj is asking why IR and Raman spectroscopy are complementary to each other. Okay. I think this you so have discussed in your slides also. Yes. So complementary in a sense, uh, it actually again is decided by uh, the symmetry of the molecule that we are studying. If the molecule does not have any center of inversion symmetry, so the same, all the vibrations will be seen in both IR and Raman active uh, spectrum, in the Raman spectrum, and then they are not very complementary. But you know that is a very rare example. Often the system or the molecule will have some uh, you know, differences in the symmetry, and, uh, and some symmetry, and because of those symmetries, especially center of inversion symmetry, some of the uh, uh, phonons or vibrations will be Raman active, some vibrations will be IR active, and that's when they become complementary. Kapil Nayak uh, has sent a question, how the in-plane vibration and out-of-plane vibration are changes with the sample thickness, and what is the reason behind their change? Okay. The I I guess he he refers to graphene. So, see for the in-plane vibration, if we say um, in both the cases, in-plane and uh, the out-of-plane vibration, the moment we have uh, a, a not, a more than one layer. So that layers are uh, layers interact with each other through van der Waals interaction. So there is a van der Waals interaction that now comes into play, and that van der Waals interaction will make changes in the vibrations of the phonons that we otherwise talk about in just single layer. And these interactions will change the moment we have more and more number of uh, layers. And that is why both the in-plane and out-of-plane vibrations will respond the moment we have more than one number of layers. Manpreet has sent, uh, please answer in UV visible spectrometer, why transmittance is a study that 550 nanometer most of the time? 560 nanometer. 550 nanometer. Okay. Well, you see, um, I think UV visible spectrometer, when we look at uh, the transmission or absorption, it basically um, depends on the sample that we're talking about. So uh, 550 is very uh, specific. Uh, it is very close to 2.3 electron volt. So if you're looking at uh, band gaps, which is of this range, so we'll be dealing with, uh, uh, you know, especially, especially 550 nanometer or so. But if I have systems, let's say if I have a semiconductor which has uh, a band gap about one nanometer or let's say two, sorry, one electron volt or let's say about one and a half electron volt, then um, I'll be talking about something else. So it depends on the choice of uh, sample that one is talking about. And there is one request from Yaswant Venkatraman. Uh, sir, if possible, please share these videos. I think they are already available on YouTube. So there is, there is nothing to discuss. Okay. Uh, Avinas uh, has written, Sir, XRD measured from different diffractometers, such as pan-analytical, Rigaku, Ritz Seifert, etc., gives the same structural pattern for a compound, whereas Raman measurements from different laser sources gives different patterns. Why is it so? <laughs> Very good question. So, you see, I mean, first of all, if we are talking about um, uh, vibrations, the phonons of any given crystal lattice. I would say that if even if we change the laser wavelength, I would not a priori expect any change in the frequency or the vibrational frequencies. Okay, um, but depends on the context. If let's say the sample has um, some other uh, conditions, let's say for example, the sample has a band gap which is close to the laser wavelength that I'm using. Okay, I may use a laser which is lower than the band gap. I may use a laser which is exactly equal to the band gap of the material, or I may also use a laser which is higher than the band gap. Then in that case, in those cases, what happens? Some resonance processes will come into play. 
and depending on that some new modes may appear and that is why the raman spectrum uh, show uh, may show some shift or you know slight differences additional thing that one may also see is when you change the laser uh, wavelength if there are some fluorescence or photoluminescence uh, transitions involved so some lasers may not excite those photoluminescence transitions and that is where you will see purely vibrations in the spectrum but if let's say i change the laser and the laser is capable to excite some photoluminescence transitions then in addition to those vibrational modes i might also see photoluminescence transitions in the spectrum and that's when again the spectrum will change so these are different conditions when uh, change the laser may change the spectrum but as a ground state um, um, i mean if i say in general the raman spectrum should not change unless there are these in you know, other conditions involved in the sample okay uh, pinky rani is asking what are eg tg modes and how we recognize these modes in raman data okay so in raman spectrum the every i mean every mode is assigned some symmetry notation typically a b e t or f are used when uh, a or b is used basically that means it is a non degenerate mode that means the vibration is uh, um is unique and it has no degeneracy but a and b would mean there is a slight difference in uh, symmetry operation of the two different modes on the other hand the e e is a doubly degenerate mode uh, e means so there will be two different modes which will have the same energy and uh, same symmetry so they are put together and called as the e mode and similarly t or f is a triply degenerate mode where uh, there are three different vibrations or three different modes are of same energy now uh, g comes because there is a center of inversion symmetry associated which is why uh, the phonon is uh, raman active then the g comes into but if it is u then that means it is ir active mode let's say for example au will be an ir active mode or ag will be uh, an uh, a raman active mode so that's how the notations and these notations come from um, symmetry operations uh, jyoti is asking how energy conservation is possible in anti stokes lines well energy conservation if you really say is happening in all the processes um it, uh, but the if you see the total picture so some amount of energy is given let's say for example i shine a laser light and putting on a sample so the laser light is going to give some energy to the sample and is going to create a phonon so there is a small amount of energy which is delivered or you know transferred onto the sample but if you see the total energy uh, uh, you know is uh, it's is constant it is it is um, same but the some amount of energy is given to the sample which creates the phonon but on the other hand in the anti stokes case uh, the laser can take some energy from the sample which is by uh, annihilating or you know killing some of the phonons and that's when the energy of the light will be higher than the uh, incident light and that is where the anti stokes overall you see the energy is conserved but there is a give and take process in the energy to the system from the laser light. Pragya Joshi is writing how to find crystal defects from from Raman spectroscopy data. Crystal defects from Raman spectroscopy data. Well, <clears throat> so that yes. depends on. Um, so if I refer to graphene, so that has a very unique uh, description, uh, where defects in graphene can be very easily seen as a D peak in graphene. but let's say apart from graphene if we're talking about in any other crystal whether it is uh, you know some ceramic or something then um, you see um, there has to be a certain amount of defect which has to change the local environment of the atoms which are involved in the vibration and if that defect is enough sufficient to you know affect the vibration 
then we can probe uh, or we can see the signature of the defect in the vibration. And that could be, uh, you know, as a possible possible shift in the vibration or, you know, a change in the uh, line shape. But sometimes a defect could also be seen as uh, in a photoluminescence in the spectrum. So that is also another way to look at defects in the crystals. Bidisa Mukherjee is offering thanks for the nice presentation and also requesting, can you please suggest a textbook on Raman spectroscopy in lattice vibration? A textbook she is uh, asking to okay. suggest. Okay. Depends on the level that one is talking about. So one book, let's say, which is at the very, very simple and basic level, especially for um, you know initial uh, master's students or uh, maybe I would say rather bachelor students. So this is, uh, we all know, uh, Fundamentals of Molecular Spectroscopy by Banuel. Um, you know, this is the book I'm showing. I don't know if one can see it clearly. So this is uh, a book which is a very simple and easy read, but if one wants to go beyond, so there are then uh, you know, several books. Um, for example, uh, there is a book by, um, 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 what is that? Raman scattering by, um, what's the name? Uh, um, so there's a series of book uh, by Manuel Cardona, which deals with uh, very in-depth details of uh, different applications of Raman scattering, especially in uh, semiconductors. And there one can study uh, the magnetic effects, the electron phonon uh, effects, the you know, the various processes. So there's a series of book uh, on light scattering by Manuel Cardona, M. Cardona. I think there are eight, uh, eight such volumes. So that is very, very in-depth. Um, and then there is uh, one more book. I don't remember now. Maybe I can share uh, later with, uh, with some audience. I don't know how, but uh, I can share. Uh, Kar Simran Singh uh, has asked the same question which you have previously answered. He is asking about to elaborate and distinguish the application of conventional Raman and resonance Raman spectroscopy. I think you can skip this question because you have already answered about it. Uh, if you want, okay. if, you, if you want to add something, uh, then you can. I mean, uh, I'll be uh, basically repeating the same. But since the time is, you know, I've all eaten up so much of time, I do not to kill others very little time. Pali uh, Dehria is asking, in vibrational diagram, symmetric stretching is outward, then what can we say if there is an inward direction? There is in inward direction. Okay. I think this is see, not very clear, but she wants to ask. I, okay. If, okay. Being a student, I can imagine what could she be asking. <laughs> so, uh, imagine, uh, I don't know if the person is able to see, let's say these are two atoms, right? And these two atoms are bonded with some spring, imagine. So when I'm saying symmetric stretching, stretching, that means they are moving away and coming back. So it is outward, inward, okay? So it's the same thing. When it is outward movement, that does not mean the atoms are moving just outward for infinite time. They have to come back to the, you know, their regular positions. And once they come back to their regular positions, they will again recoil and then go inward. So that is what is both outward and inward movement of the atoms is basically the symmetric stretching. And there is no uh, only, um, only outward movement of the atoms. And uh, again, not only inward movement, it is the both, which basically is displacement of the atoms with respect to their regular positions. I hope. Bidisa, Bidisa is asking, how can one understand about the size and shape of ellipsoid in case of Raman activity determination? Size and shape of the ellipsoid. Yes. Okay. So ellipsoid it is basically a representation of uh, a bit complex um, thing. So one has to look at the Raman tensor the Raman tensor, which consists of uh, the polarizability tensor. Now one has to you know, go into a little detail. So it's basically the tensor elements. Um, so if you look at the three-dimensional system, you have nine elements uh, in the tensor. 
and those nine elements will uh, if you can plot them you know to visualize how each of these elements are contributing and how much is the contribution of each of these elements one would see that it is you know, sort of an ellipsoid shape when uh, it is in the molecule is in regular position that means it is not vibrating but once the molecule starts to vibrate that means the atoms are displacing from the regular position and the moment the displacements happen you have to dynamically take into care of those changes in the tensor elements the tensor components and then correspondingly one has to see how visualize how the ellipsoid is changing so i believe that's what is the question so now once the vibration is uh, in place the ellipsoid would change from its regular uh, shape and structure uh, there is a question from chandni bhat uh, she is asking what kind of change should be expected in raman mood when nano structure semiconductor material is doped with n or p type dopant except shifting of raman mood peak okay <clears throat> so um now if you're talking about n or p type of doping um one has to really analyze the details of the spectrum uh, okay so see we're talking about n or p that means i'm talking about charges i'm talking about electrons or holes so the moment i have electrons there is certain uh, condition that is set in when i'm talking about holes there is certain condition that is set in now in presence of electrons or holes one has to see whether the phonons that i am probing through raman are they able to interact with those charges if yes then only there will be implications of those doping onto the phonons and then one may be able to really see and it may not be very straight forward to say that yes this is how one should be expecting a change one also needs to build up some theoretical model to really analyze the data it will not be very straight forward hope this is clear uh, rajesh kumar has written can we use raman spectroscopy for optical property of silicate phosphorus optical properties of i repeat can we use raman spectroscopy for optical property of silicate phosphorus it is silicate phosphorus okay silicate phosphorus i do not have much yes. of an idea of this so um, if it is in the crystalline form i believe uh, there should be vibrational response to it and um, then one can do more analysis of the rama spectrum and one can see uh, now optical um, uh, characterization means um, so you see raman basically deals with the vibrations the phonons right it does not necessarily tell you about the optical gap or any other uh, you know parameters that are associated with the optical aspects of it so but then when you change that material with uh, i don't know maybe with some doping or something you are probably changing uh, you know the optical band gap or optical uh, properties and that might also amount to changes in the vibrational states and that is where one can possibly connect mm, with raman but directly saying optical properties with raman it it may not be straight forward anjali jain's question is in ftir spectrum analysis which wavelength range shows the material characteristics as we take a spectrum from 400 to 4000 cm inverse okay so uh, 400 to 4000 cm inverse is uh, typically useful for um, molecules or compounds which involve let's say hydrogen nitrogen and you know some low mass elements and that's why you see um, in uh, people who are dealing with uh, solvents or the similar agents they would mostly prefer to use in this range but let's say when we're talking about uh, compounds which have high element high z uh, elements for example heavy mass elements then one has to go below 400 and that's where one has to deal with the far infrared region and one may have to go down to even 5 or 10 wave numbers and not restrict down to only 400 so it depends on the crystal or the molecule that one is looking at and whether the vibrations should be expected below 400 or not otherwise often um, you know these compounds 
would show a response in the 400 to 4000 range. Uh, Priya uh, has written, what are the practical approach for first and second order Raman move? What are the, what approach? Practical approach. What are the practical approach for first and second order Raman move? Practical approach? <laughs> yes. Well, I'm not very sure if I understood the question. Yes, yes, um, yes. Uh, well, one, if let's say if I have a sample and if I measure the Raman spectrum, and if I do some you know, theoretical uh, you know, study to not means, it doesn't mean that I have to really go into uh, proper calculation, uh, but do some simple uh, modeling and see uh, what would be the, the first order of modes. That means the normal modes of vibrations that would be expected. Then one can see that, okay, these is, is, is phonons could be, I mean, in the spectrum, this is, is, is uh, peaks could be the first order modes, but anything which is beyond that, uh, could amount to uh, second order or higher order modes. Now, there are some very distinctive features for a first order and second order modes. The first order modes are typically very sharp and very strong. Very strong means even though we say Raman signal is very weak, in that respect, the first order modes are quite strong and quite sharp. But when we talk about second order or higher order modes, the intensity of these modes will be very, very weak and uh, quite broad. So that could be one of the distinctive way to start thinking whether these are higher order modes or first order modes. There are a few more questions. If you, if, if, if you are comfortable, then we can, uh, we can have them. Otherwise, we can and I, I really feel bad that I took very long time in, uh, you know, I don't know if maybe, <laughs> no. I'm fine. I can go ahead. <laughs> okay, there is one question from Nitika. She is asking, what are hot bands? Hot bands. Yes, I. Uh, well, I'm not sure what she connects to. Okay. The, the second question she has also written: What is the effect of n harmonicity on vibration spectra of a diatomic molecule? Okay. Well, it is the n harmonicity that always plays a role. Reason being, if we think of let's say just purely harmonic model, which is what we always do, harmonic model would give me a frequency for that diatomic molecule. And uh, then uh, now imagine if that molecule undergoes a change in temperature, right? Now the temperature change will not make any change to uh, the molecule until and unless there is an harmonicity. Remember, if we, uh, you know, if we go back to Kittel's uh, you know, chapter five um, or chapter four, six, I don't remember. So you need to have an harmonicity in order to see thermal expansion in any material. So uh, enharmonicity is always there, but only at very, very low temperatures, the enharmonicity contribution is extremely small or can be neglected. So that's when the phonon frequency will have no response to changes in temperature. If you remember the curve that I showed, um, It'll, it'll remain flat, but as the temperature raises up, or if there is an harmonicity, that's when the frequencies would uh, you know, respond to the temperature and um, an harmonicity will be uh, you know, giving rise to changes in frequency. Um, there is one question from Nancy. She is asking, can we identify the possibility of Raman resonance in any material before taking Raman spectra? Uh, yes, uh, one can actually make a, um, a smart guess. So for example, if we know the band gap of a material, and if I have the scope to choose or select a laser, which is very, very close to the band gap energy, then I may be able to, uh, you know, hit the resonant process. There is a question from Marla Prasanti. She is asking, what is polarized Raman spectral analysis? In India, where we get this polarized Raman spectra, how can we interpret it? <laughs> okay. Well, most of the Raman spectrometers will have the capability to do the polarization-based Raman spectroscopy. Polarization-based or polarized Raman spectrum means, uh, you see, 
when we talk about uh, the monochromatic laser, right? Often, if not every time, often it is a polarized light. That means the, the laser light will have a very well-defined polarization. And that is allowed to incident on the sample. But the scattered light will have contributions of all different polarizations. I mean, the response uh, of the orientations of the crystals that one may have, right? So the scattered light will have all possible contributions of uh, the polarization. Now one has to use an analyzer to choose or select from those. And then we call the polarized Rama spectrum. So that will basically remove some of the peaks and only retain certain peaks, which will be again, depend on polarization selection rule. So it depends on which mode we're talking about, whether it's the A mode or E mode or F mode. So polarization will have selection to these modes depending on which orientation of the polarizer or the analyzer that we're keeping. And depending on, we'll be able to see only certain modes and not all the modes. One can do polarization uh, Raman almost everywhere. You just have there to have, are... one just have to have an analyzer for, uh, which is, uh, you know, useful for that particular laser. There are many more questions, but I think most of them are repeated ones. So I hope uh, all the participants have got their answers or doubt, uh, their doubts cleared. Uh, because of uh, the answers. And uh, now uh, we all thank Dr. Saha uh, for uh, his nice presentation. And uh, on behalf of the organizing committee members, I thank Dr. Saha for his excellent talk. And I believe that all the participants have benefited immensely from his talk. And uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Saha. <laughs> and, so before uh, I wind up, I would. I would actually like to thank uh, all of you, all the organizers, uh, especially Ajit and Yashpalji and uh, Varmaji for uh, you know, this wonderful opportunity. This is, as I said in the beginning, that this is a very unique opportunity and also uh, you know, one of its own kind, presenting something through you know, uh, online media. Uh, I have yeah, never done it before and this is the first time I'm doing it. Yeah. Thank you so much for reaching, is... uh, for helping me to reach out to so big and wider uh, audience. Thank you once yeah, again. This, this is something for all of us to explore. <laughs> <laughs> so the, there is an announcement for all the participants. The another lecture will be from uh, 2 p.m. and it will be on density functional theory. So we all meet uh, at 2 p.m. Uh, to listen that lecture. Now we will leave this meeting for now. Uh, thank you all once again. Thank you, Dr. Saha, mm -hmm. once again. Thank you so much. Is uh, Dr. Yes, Dr. Yeshpal, you want to say something? Hello. Is my yes. audio working now? Okay. Yes. So I just want to thank uh, Dr. Sa again, and uh, yep, thank you very much, Dr. Sa. It was a, a really very wonderful talk, and uh, yep, it made even my basics clear on Raman spectroscopy. So thank you very much. You. We'll see you again. Yep, soon, probably. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yep. So that's all from us. I'm ending, ending the meeting now. Thank you very much, Dr. Verma. Thank you. <laughs> thank you.